what we're going to try to do is condense the remainder of this course into the next two sessions. And that's not, that's not really un, unbelievable, but we will see how it goes. Um, um, I've condensed everything into two sessions now. Let's see if we can make it through without dying of confusion. Page 26 in your, in your handouts at our workbook is, is entitled uh, Verbs Introduction. Not a lot there, just a lot of first, net, first letters. Um, but it's an outline of all of the aspects of the verb that you'll encounter. So let's take a look at uh, what those aspects are. First of all, let's take a look at what you're going to do in terms of parsing. When you, when we used to talk about declining a, a, a noun by describing it in terms of gender, case, and number. Verbs, when you, when you do the same thing, it's called parsing. And you divide it into these five categories. Every uh, regular verb is going to have each of these. And they are tense. You can go ahead and fill in now. We'll come back to each one of them. Voice, mood, person, and person and number. We will know we know the other two: person and number. From uh, as, as just like like nouns. So let's take a look at what each of these are. The um, obviously. Every verb that we know of in English is, is in a certain tense. And tense acts the same way in Greek, with a, with a little bit of a, a little nuance added to it. But let me give you a definition that is not one that's really, I believe I just made it up, but this is, this is what tense does. The verb's tense explains the verb's action by signifying what time it takes place and what kind of action it is. We know about time and we're used to the past, present, and future tenses in English. But there are also aspects of a verb that have to do with what kind of action it is, whether that action is simple or more complex, whether it is completed already or whether it is in the process of being completed. So that kind of action also is, is in play when we're looking at what the various tenses in Greek do. Not just time. We're also thinking about kind. In fact, once we get out of the indicative mood, and we'll talk about moods as an aspect of the verb as well, once we get out of indicative mood, time is not the issue. And all of the markers for time gets, get lost in the word. And so what you're dealing with is, is uh, aspects of the verb other than the time that the action is taking place. But most of our, major, our, our tenses are going to deal with both. They're going to deal with time that the action is taking place and what kind of action it is. So let's take a look at the tenses. First is the ever popular present tense. An example of that is the Greek word ledo is in the present tense. And you can translate ledo as I am saying or just simply I say. So you can see already that there's a couple of, that, that, that the present tense expresses two different kinds of action. One, the simple or what they call gnomic, just basic bland action, I say, but also the more continuous I am saying is expressed by the present tense as well. And of course you have to look in the context to see which is the best in terms of translation. The future tense, of course, we're well, familiar with that as well from English. Future tense expresses the action taking place in the future. 
So time of action is, is important for future tense, and, it, and, uh, and the uh, future of Lego is arrow. It's an irregular future, but I wanted to use all of the same words in English, so I'm using this one. Arrow, which means I, I will say. The third tense is the imperfect. Imperfect expresses a time of action in the past with no reference to its completion. An English translation of elegon is I was saying. Now this is basically the word elego. The, the stick sim is there, and this, this, this epsilon up at the front is called an augment. It is, a, it is a sign of the imperfect tense. Augment plus the stem plus a person and number suffix equals the imperfect. The epsilon is... The epsilon is the augment. Is the augment? Yes. For the imperfect? Yes. But how come it's in the aorist in the future and the perfect in the blue perfect? Because aorist is, is just plain weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, also that's future. true. Here you, you don't see it that, uh, that, that, is that distinctive. But, oh. but trust me. I see. Never mind. Because there's leg on and then they added the epsilon where in the future it's like the Lama fell away and all the other tenses. Right, what you need to say is that this is, this is the dictionary Legon. form of elegon is Lego. Okay. And that's where you'll see that the augment is clear. Mm -hmm. Once you've added, just, just added to the dictionary form this augment and then the uh, person and number suffix for it. So it is, it is quite easy to, to find an imperfect, to, to identify an imperfect from its form. The tense when it is not easy to understand, to define and, and clarify from its form is the aorist, because the aorist tends to just take, although there are two forms, one is rather, rather simple. It, it has an augment just like the imperfect and it uh, has a sigma in it just before its person number suffix. Those are what's called first errors. But most of the errors that you encounter are, in, are second errors and they change the stem. And that's what happens here in the word ipon. Ipon is the errors, the second errors form of Lego. Errors in terms of its tense is a simple action in past time. The way it would be translated here, I said. It's important you understand this because you hear a whole lot from preachers about the aorist tense. And a lot of points are made about the aorist tense. But the fact is, aorist tense is the, is the workhorse. It is the uh, jack of all trades of tenses. It's simple action in past time, and it is used a great deal in the New Testament. And so it's not usually very smart to put a whole lot of theological import on the fact that a verb happens to be in the aorist tense. I have done it on certain occasions. For example, when there are two verbs in a text, and one of them is in present tense and the other is in aorist and they're both compared to each other. That, I think, there, there, there is an a, a importance in, in a collection like that, because what you're seeing is that the author has, has purposely chosen a present tense and compared it to an heiress. And so you're going to have to find out the theological implication of that. But generally, when you find an heiress tense, it is, it's the jack of all trades, and so uh, don't, don't uh, overanalyze it. 